So one does not simply control the class climate. Um, <laughs> understatement, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's difficult. The beginning of the semester, we start with this pop, right? Uh, we have a lot of energy. Our students are happy to be on campus or back on campus. And then through the course of the semester, happenings happen. All sorts of that. And so what we're going to discuss today is how we can start utilizing more of our blended learning technologies, more of what we have our hands on already, what our students are already ingrained in, their patterns, their cultures, microcultures if it would be, um, and talk about it in a little bit more of a pedagogically focused uh, manner, which is fun for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I'll start by introducing ourselves. Um, as we were saying to a couple people before, with, what's kind of interesting about this is we teach at different institutions in completely, completely different disciplines. And yeah, so we, we can kind of have a compare and contrast a little bit for how this works. Um, these are examples from our student meme wars that we've had. I'm the Seth Rogen lookalike on the right there. Um, I'm Brian Moritz. I teach in the School of Communication Media and the Arts at SUNY Oswego which is about 45 minutes north of Syracuse, if you don't know your New York geography. Uh, I teach in our communication studies department, so I'm teaching primarily online journalism courses and skills-based courses, and I also teach a media law course, which you'll see represented later on. So I'm Dr. Nicholas Koberstein. Uh, this is me as a Schoenus Machian uh, <laughs> in uh, Salzburg over the summer here. Um, I'm part of our digital learning at CUCA College initiative that we're working on to try to blend in digital initiatives into liberal arts at a high degree. Um, outside of that, I'm an assistant professor of uh, child and family studies with a dual appointment in, in psychology and then a bunch of other uh, crazy titles having to do with student affairs and our new living learning communities initiatives we're doing. And our daughters were Montessori schoolmates, which is if you're wondering how we how we kind of met, that's exactly how. In the uh, hallway waiting to pick up kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just a little bit of history on when we talk about a meme as part of the meme war. What exactly do we mean by it? And the idea, the the actual term meme, which is how it's pronounced. Uh, was uh, first coined back in 1976 by Richard Hawkins, who's an evolutionary biologist. Um, and he was using it to describe things that kind of uh, catch on and uh, become kind of popular. Basically things that went viral before the internet. So things like he would use melodies, song lyrics, um, randomly the use of arches in architecture. But it's kind of just kind of things that kind of crossed, uh, crossed cultures and just kind of became popular. Um, what we think of as the meme, as you're going to see kind of what we talk about here, really developed online in the Web 2.0 era. Um, it was in 2007, and the first website to really do this in the way that we now know it was the, if you can remember, the I Can Has Cheeseburger uh, cat yes. site. Yes. Um, and after that site became popular, one of the kind of the big changes was the creation of user-generated content. So the meme generator, there are other sites where instead of just sharing content that went viral, students and, and anybody really can kind of create their own kind of, and, and it speaks to the shared meaning I think that we see in a lot of digital spaces and in a lot of social media as well. So, so kind of talking about, uh, I'll let Nick kind of talk about, so where the idea and why we decided to do meme wars and when we decided to do them. So meme wars, kind of simple concept. Memes are fun. And that's where it started. <laughs> uh, I'm an assistant professor. I'm fairly young. I came into uh, CUCA College as my first physician on the tenure track out of an R1 school, research heavy, and ended up teaching at a 4-4 and really getting ingrained in student culture. Prior to that, the smallest class I had taught was 125 students up to 435. And so one of the things that was always in the back of my mind was how do they feel right now? Uh, because if you've got 435 students and you're not monitoring your attitude and the attitude of the class, drop off happens really quickly. And so it was about two years ago, I started seeing this in my own class as we were moving with budget crunches up to some higher caps, uh, 50 students in a class, which isn't amazingly high, but still, for our students moving to that, they were feeling a little bit forlorn for more touch. So 
the idea of using Twitter was already really high in my class. Uh, both Brian and myself do uh, Twitter office reviews for exams, uh, where we type, you know, for an hour nonstop. And so I thought, hey, let's start doing memes. And I came up with this concept of, okay, your class is going to come up with memes, and I'll give you extra credit. Not a lot. But what we're talking about here is starting to really get students, <laughs> and this is the piece, right? Really get students into this kind of culture of being somewhat esoteric with the work, right? Uh, wrapping their heads around something and delivering it, right? Because when I think digital learning, I'm thinking transmission in a new form, new ways to transmit information, right? Infographics, memes, Twitter, all of those. And so this activity centered around trying to make the move there, but also having fun, and then giving students what they repeatedly ask for in that kind of late end of the semester is extra credit. Which, in my view, doesn't really matter. Because three points here, six points there, when I'm grading out of a 450 point scale, are meaningless to me, but to them, stoke them up a little. It makes them feel like work they're doing to extend themselves is meaningful and that I care about them doing this. And in actuality, I do. I care about memes quite a bit and I care about them in class. And so when they're asking about these extra credit opportunities, you can sit there waggle your finger and go, well, I've got something in store for you. <laughs> and I think it's, it's also, it's this motivational factor I mean, both, for both Nick and myself. The meme war is an optional thing, it's not at all required as part of the course. Not all students are on Twitter, not all students, believe it or not, for millennials, not all students know how to make a meme. Um, and so, but it, so it's completely optional. So giving them that kind of, that agency, uh, I think is a big part of the, the success of this assignment. Letting them kind of do it, like kind of like the dawn of realization, like we get to drag our professor on Twitter. Yes, you get to drag your professor on Twitter. And the extra credit is similar too. It's like three points and I can see it in Blackboard when I put the three points in. It raises their gr overall semester grade like a couple decimal points, like maybe three tenths of a point. It does not affect their grade. But I think you have to have something like that. This is the carrot and the stick. You have to have that carrot that's going to give them the reason to do it. Otherwise, some people would do it, but other, otherwise it would probably just kind of fall flat out. And also, I, th I, I think one of the things we talk about with the third quarter slump, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, and when I begin the, 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 in all my classes, I'm a 3-3. So whenever I begin this, I say, be, so it's the Monday of the final week of class. I'm like, what's your stress level at right now? And everyone, you, know, you can imagine the answer. It's like off the charts. It's like 87 on a scale of 1 to 10, right? And so everyone's kind of dragging. Everyone's kind of, you know, over it. If it's December, you know, they've just come back from Thanksgiving. They've got a week and a half. It's starting to snow. It snows in New York, if you, maybe you don't know. <laughs> we get a lot of snow because we're on the lake. So the weather's starting to go bad. And in May, it's, you know, summer is, the weather's finally nice now. And, like, all of a sudden, that, that they're kind of, like, trying to push through and so this is kind of like that little that little jolt of caffeine to kind of get them get them pumped again and get them going back through this time so um, so this is where we start talking about something I call the third unit crisis um, generally on college campuses and syllabus wide we see a lot of people split things into thirds why thirds well because you can fit about one month of curriculum in and test three separate times the semester and that's usually how we start sculpting it out threes and fours seem palatable to us when we start splitting things out so this first unit's pretty good. Students are starting to get in our classrooms. We are energetic. The topics are new to them. They're novel. And so their motivation level starts going off. In this second unit, we kind of plateau. Why? Well, we can't really go much higher. We're already giving it all we've got, right? And then, unfortunately, what happens is <laughs> right at the end of unit two and that second exam, yeah. we start falling. Now, a couple of things happens here. Second exams are a doozy. You've already got all of the theoretical material that we need you to know. We tested that on the first. Your retention of that may not be very high. That's something we've got to think about here. Or it could just be that that kind of dusts you off. The combination of the environment outside of the classroom, the environment inside the classroom. This is when we start seeing attendance issues, right? 
and we start falling off. And so to correct for this, we've got to start thinking about how we give that jolt to the classroom. How can we up this in kind of a synthetic manner? Because our attitude, our abilities in that classroom and our personalities aren't really going to get us through this. Mm -hmm. So this is where we start aligning ourselves a little bit more. Um, give yourself room in those first two. Don't go all in in your personality in those first units. Uh, because what we need to do is have a little bit left for that second unit too. Because what we call in the field of family studies a plateau is stagnation. Uh, change is always happening. If you're not changing, that's bad. So that flat line in our idea is not a good thing. And that's literally what I would see as predictive of that drop. Since we know this drop's going to happen, we're not going to stop the drop. <clears throat> it, it, the drop's going to be there. We have environmental factors we can't really control. Uh, we've got student factors that we can't control. And so the drop's going to happen. But what we don't want to do is allow it to drop all the way. So we initiate mean course. <clears throat> And we do it very quickly after that second exam or that second unit to start reinstilling students. And we start using all of the content that's at the end of the semester. Mind you, this content at the end of the semester is usually not our favorite content. Usually we rifle through it a little bit fast. Sometimes we're under time constraints because of snow cancellations because we just got three feet overnight, right? All of these things start getting there. And so by this meme war, we're trying to up this student motivation. And what it does is it allows the students then to drop off when they can, which is at the end of all of this and at the end of class. And then their motivation can drop. But again, we're hoping it doesn't drop all the way. And we'll show you in this and, and speak to our students coming back for me wars <laughs> a semester later, rejoining the pack and dragging us through the dirt a little bit more. <laughs> so this was the first uh, the first me more post that Nick posted back in May of 2017. So he did it before me. I, I watched him do it and completely I copied him. No, no shame. Cit citation Cobra scene 2017. Um, but I absolutely this did. Is, this is me and. Uh, fifth grade <laughs> and on the bottom oh, sorry. on the bottom you can see sadly Koberstein wasn't kidding when he said explore your identity <laughs> I teach human development <laughs> so, so really quick is I want we want to make sure we get to examples in our findings so if you want to search on Twitter for either uh, hashtag Casey me mores or hashtag more it's me more um, you will be able to see examples of what our students have pulled. But generally, the way, the, uh, the, the way I structure mine is they have one week to do it. All students can do two memes. One that has to be tangentially course related. Um, and one can be a wild card. It can be about anything. Everyone who does two, they get three points added to their lowest grade. And what I do is the one across my three sections that has the most engagement, likes, retweets, that kind of thing, they get five points added. Onto, the, onto theirs, and I like and retweet everyone that has uh, that that gets posted to give them an equal opportunity of you know of my followers. I know Nick basically the same, so uh, I just want to show some, uh, get some examples from Nick's. These are all that you're going to see. These are all student generated memes. Um, so this is kind of a crisis, uh, course related one. You can't have a midlife crisis if your entire life is a crisis. Uh, emailing my professor is like, is it too late to? Say you gotta, you gotta sing. No, you gotta sing. Sing. okay, okay. This is yours. You can sing. <laughs> so, and this was, this one was for mine. Um, my wife could not believe how well the student got me, <laughs> and I had only had her for one class. This was not a repeat student, and she, I mean, she, she crushed this. Is really accurate, frighteningly accurate. Um, <laughs> and this was a uh, so so because I teach an online journalism course there we have uh, uh, like fewer theoretical things you can tweet about uh, but this is we use medium for a lot of our classes and when the embed doesn't work and so if you know this one it's Dumbledore doing like the, the frustrated shrug thing <laughs> so in this one I'm actually gonna have to ban um, this is the first one that did it last year this is my law class um, and there were at least two to three versions of this that students did this past semester in spring, in spring, this is from the fall, 
And so we may have to retire this one just because get creative, think of something new. But this is the beauty of what's happening in these classes. These students are starting to catch on to culture in the class. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes a cultural reference point for them. And they start reusing it and reusing it in different ways with different means and slightly different contexts. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do here. I mean, mm -hmm. that's academic <coughs> in a piece, right? Mm -hmm. Take the context, build off of it, right. take your own spin, and keep going. So what we found here, we'll just do some, some quick numbers. Um, my fall class had 292 total posts of the meme war, and I had former students who were chiming in saying, why wasn't this a thing when I was taking your class? <laughs> my wife and my best friend were offering up evidence to, to my students to use, like, hit me up if you need stuff. Um, and so in, to in terms of total engagements, um, the one troubling thing with hashtags is if you don't measure it within like a week and, or are paying a ton of money to a social media manager, you can't get really good metrics. So I don't have really great ones for the spring, but um, I had almost 300,000 total uh, uh, page views and engagements off of that first meme war. Um, I know your numbers were kind of sim or similar as you did yeah, class. Yeah, my first I had about 460 something posts to our hashtag. Um, our total engagements were about 12,000, so 12,000 clicks, likes, retweets. Uh, profile expansions, and our reach was just around 450,000. Yeah, my reach was about 300,000. Um, How many and, and students are in your classes? So I have about 60 to 70 per semester, and I know you go I have 100 in yeah. two sections. So uh, one thing I, I, that I found that was interesting in, my, in one of my classes is I had a very quiet class in the, in the fall semester. They just were dead silent. I could not get them you know, to, to going in class, and it was really frustrating. When I introduced the meme war, that brought them out of their shell. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were t they were into it. I mean, they were going all off. Um, what I found interesting about this is when we were thinking about this originally, like, okay, this is a sign. This brings out student engagement. I had a similarly quiet class this past semester, and they were dead on the meme war. They didn't really <laughs> post anything. And so, uh, you know, I, I we're still kind of working some theory on this, but that suggests to me this this idea, this type of like latent. Um, engagement where that first class was totally engaged with the course and the material they were just quiet or not kind of traditionally engaged in that and so this is a way to bring that out so we have about a minute left so and I think you know the general positivity that the course brought that this brings to the course is palpable I think for us and so where we're jumping off now is starting to really start to measure that uh, third unit crisis mm -hmm. starting to look at mechanisms to measure student motivation at multiple points throughout the semester and starting to really try to get some quantitative measures behind what this engagement is looking like we don't want to rest an anecdote it's not something that we're going to do with this um, but moving from this and getting those metrics is difficult. Mm -hmm. So, well, here's our end. So it says, did we just get a line on our CV for talking about me? <laughs> yeah. So thank you guys very much.